the 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 temperature dependent viscosity gives you plates. It makes the the lithosphere rigid, um, but the plastic yield stress is needed so that those plates can break. And that's, this is you know a, a, a very obvious feature of rocks. We have earthquakes, we have faults, and so forth. But it turns out that this is a crucial ingredient for, for plate tectonics. So here's a simulation um, that I like to show. And I'll just let it run for a little bit and then pause it and describe some of the features. So let me pause it right here. Nope, that's not what I want. I want to pause it. OK. Um, um, sorry, I've blown it. OK, let's play it a little bit and pause it. All right. So what you see in the top is the horizontal speed at the surface of the model domain. And so where the line is at minus one, like there, there's a, a, um, a, a motion to the left at the surface, and then you see motion to the right, motion to the left, motion to the right, and there are these sharp transitions. And these are effectively plate boundaries between what are plates. And we call them plates because they move coherently, rigidly. Um, and we have zones of downwelling where we have convergence between a right moving plate and a left moving plate. And then we have what are mid-ocean ridges, which are um, divergence between a left moving plate and a right moving plate. Um, and the, then the, the, the domain here shows you the convective flow patterns. And these are um, contours of temperature. So this is a hot core of a convection cell. This is a cold downwelling. And here we have a warm upwelling beneath this, this mid-ocean ridge. So a lot about plate tectonics is captured by this um, by this this numerical simulation and by this combination of ingredients here. Um, and I'll let it play for a little bit so we can enjoy the plate reorganizations and the the, the variations in the convective regime that that occur. Okay, so what does this simulation get right? Well, it it shows that you can produce broad plates with narrow boundaries between them. Um, it produces passive divergent uh, plate boundaries known as mid-ocean ridges, and it produces active convergent plate boundaries, uh, which are like subduction zones. What is it lacking or what does it get wrong, let's say? So for one thing, the yield stress is simply uh, a phenomenological um, uh, limit which is imposed. We say that if the stress at a point builds up to above this limit, then there's a failure of the material and then it can yield it at low stress. But we haven't said what the physical basis for that is. Um, it doesn't include chemical heterogeneity. We know that that's important. Uh, and it doesn't include continents and continental rifting, which is obviously something we care a lot about for a variety of reasons, be they the fact that we live and we evolved on continents or because continents are hosting a lot of important resources that we need to understand the distribution of. So there's one-sided subduction uh, that isn't isn't seen in this in this um, simulation, and we don't have any uh, strike slip or poloidal motion because it's a 2D model, of course. Okay, so this leaves us with some big open questions, and I'm I'm not going to touch on all of these, of course, but I want to focus on a couple of them. So does magmatism play a mechanical role in the existence and the character of plate tectonics on Earth? Would this simulation look very different if magma were part of the mechanical model that, that is in here? It, it's of course not. Um, and does magmatism enable or promote rifting of the lithosphere and especially the continental lithosphere? So this is the, this is the, the theme that I wanna focus on today. So if we, if we step back and think about more of a conceptual model here, what are the candidate forces for rifting continents? You know, something needs to pull on the continents to break them apart. So what could that, what, what are the list of things that that, that could be? Well, um, slab pull is certainly one of them. Um, and we're going to talk about these in detail. So let me just gloss over it right now. But slab pull is certainly a major force for plate tectonics. But another force is the uh, is potent, gravitational potential energy gradients. So um, when mountains get pushed up, um, they want to uh, spread apart and, and uh, mid-ocean ridges, which are uh, topographic highs, um, create a ridge push force. So these, these gradients and gravitational potential energy want to drive a sort of spreading um, flow in the, in the surface plates. Um, so that's another potential. And then of course, beneath the lithosphere, 
there's some mantle convection and that mantle convection could exert tractions on the base of the plate. So these are the candidate uh, forces for rifting of continents. And there are probably some other ones that which, um, which I haven't mentioned, but could be, could be considered, but I think they probably are, are related to the ones that I have mentioned. Okay, so let's talk about subduction first. Um, and let me also say that I really would be happy to be interrupted um, with questions about clarification um, or whatever. Um, it will help me to know whether I'm going too fast or too slow, um, or if there are interesting related ideas that, that I could comment on that I haven't. So please feel free to, to interrupt. I'm not able to see you, so you just have to speak up. Anyway, um, Forsyth and Ueda, 1975, it's an absolutely um, uh, crucial paper in our understanding of plate tectonics. And what they showed was that plates that have subducting slabs move much faster than plates that don't have subducting slabs, um, or for which the percentage of the perimeter of the plate that's connected to a subducting slab is small. So the plates that are on the right of this bar chart all have um, high velocities uh, and in the, in the hotspot reference frame. And they also have uh, large fractions of their perimeter is a subduction, subducting is a subduction zone trench. So they have, um, so slab pull is acting on these plates and that is uh, what Forsyth and Ueda concluded is the key driving force for plate tectonics. And so you might think that this is, you know, the most likely candidate for rifting. And so here's some work from um, Sasha Brun's group. And, uh, and what they did is they looked at a um, mantle convection model, which included um, uh, subduction and, you know, without, you know, imposing boundary conditions because they've got a cylindrical domain. And they looked at stresses in the lithosphere associated with that subduction zone and how those stresses lead to the initiation of rifting. And what you can see from the, um, where's my mouse? Hmm. I can't see my mouse anymore. That's a bit annoying. Um, what you can see from the top row of panels to the bottom row of panels is a process by which the subduction zone, which is uh, on the left at the top of the cylinder, um, is inducing high stresses, stresses up to a few hundred MPa in the lithosphere, um, and then that's leading to a thinning of the lithosphere and, and rifting, and then acceleration of the rift. So those stresses, um, if you think of 300 MPa over a 50 kilometer thick lithosphere, that gives you a force of over 15 terranewtons per meter. So what is a terranewton? Well, it's a lot of force. So, but you're probably not very familiar with these units. Don't worry yet, it will become more meaningful. But let's say more than 15 terranewtons is, is a lot. Okay, but we can make a simple observation just from looking at a map. Um, so not all rifts are connected to subduction zones. And um, I wanna you know, highlight, especially for the audience here, that, that the East African rift system is not obviously connected to a subduction zone, certainly not a major subduction zone. There's, certain, there's subduction around the Mediterranean, um, but it's not one of the major subduction zones around the Pacific Rim. So you're actually quite far from any of these, these major subduction zones, and these plates uh, therefore have a small fraction of their perimeter, which is, is um, connected to a subduction zone. Okay, so uh, we can see this uh, in the heat flow map that really you have quite a lot of, of mid-ocean ridges and, and um, uh, incipient ridges around the East African rift system. Um, and also from the topography where you can see, you know, there are no trenches that are very close to, um, to this region. Um, so we need to look at the other candidate mechanisms and these are a little bit uh, more, more complicated. So here we're thinking about a buoyant uh, mantle blob, which is, is sort of pushing up on the lithosphere. Um, the buoyant blob is this pink stuff and the lithosphere is bowing upwards. And we look at a column through the center of the blob and then a column that's, that's off to the side. And uh, we, we use Pratt isostasy to say that the, the mass uh, above, above a certain depth is equal between these two areas and the densities are different. And so they have, they have different heights. 
And this difference in height is given by uh, h. And then we can compute the gravitational potential energy difference by integrating over that column um, the, the um, uh, density and, and, and the height. Okay, so given that gravitational potential energy for these two columns, we can look at the difference between the column uh, with the blob and without, um, and that difference in potential energy gives us a force. And the force is uh, as calculated here in the top right of the figure. Um, and uh, it's proportional to the height and to the depth of the, um, the column um, and uh, to the density and, and so forth. And you can see that we can, um, on the basis of the topography, we can infer uh, uh, to order of magnitude what the, um, uh, what the force would be in this, in this situation. And so for a kilometer of relief, and the depth of this low uh, low density region, um, we might get something like five teranewtons. So less than what we got in the case of subduction. And that's probably an upper bound on what force we could expect for this situation. Basal traction, quickly, we could say that convective stresses in the mantle are of order uh, a few megapascals, um, and they apply over plate scales that are of order a thousand kilometers. And so we might get something like three teranewtons per meter um, or less. Okay. So rifting can occur at driving forces of less than 10 teranewtons per meter. So it seems like we can't expect that all rifts are going to have the large stresses of, associated with subduction zones. So what then could we think about the strength or the weakness of continents to rifting? Well, it might come from high temperatures in the lower crust. So we might have uh, very high temperatures at shallow depth that weaken the continent um, and, and thereby enable rifting at, at these lower levels of force. Um, it could be suture zones or abandoned faults or distributed damage that are inherited from previous uh, uh, rifting episodes or from other active tectonics. Um, or it could be that there's a mantle source uh, that has uh, an abundance of magma and enables dike injection into the continent at the place where we, where we see rifting. But to some extent, these are all chicken or egg arguments, right? That high, where would these high temperatures come from? Um, it's usually rifting that leads to thinning of the lithosphere and uh, raising of the temperature. Um, and furthermore, lifting, it's rifting that creates faults and uh, damage, and these things heal over time. So suture zones is another story and, and, and potentially a more difficult one, but, um, but magmatism is clearly associated with um, uh, plumes, potentially low density uh, mantle, which might push up the lithosphere um, and, and create the force. So we kind of come to a situation where you know, it's a chicken or egg question. Which which is causing which? Is it the you know is it the magmatism that's causing the 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 rifting, or um, is rifting leading to decompression, which is uh, leading to to magmatism? And what we want to do is try to disentangle this chicken or egg situation. Of course, you know uh, the dynamics of the Earth are not a a a, um, a purely chicken or egg problem. Of course, these things are, it's a coupled system and things um, can drive each other. It doesn't have to be a, a simple causality like this. So maybe it's the, that the, it's a chicken and an egg rather than a chicken or an egg. Okay, so, so let's think about these different ways that um, continents can rift. And there are two um, end members that I wanna talk about here. Um, one of them is a kind of tectonic rifting end member where we assume that there's no magmatism, or if there is magmatism, it's just not relevant. Um, and we look at rifting by slip on faults and potentially by olivine uh, low temperature plasticity, which creates shear zones, which are a bit like, like behave a bit like faults. And so in this case, we've got a lithosphere, which is shown in the darker pink at left, and a crust, and um, the the sort of brittle envelope is shown by this green envelope, which uh, goes down. Then there are these ductile um, uh, semicircles, which are weak places 
where flow could occur. So the lower crust may be weak because it's warm and quartz rich. Um, and surely at about uh, 60 kilometers depth, we start to get into warmer mantle temperatures and then um, thermally activated creep can reduce the strength. So this so-called Christmas tree diagram tells us something about um, the stress that would be associated with a, 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 a given amount or a given rate of extension. And it's computed, um, therefore, by the, the force that would be needed to rift this a continent with this Christmas tree strength diagram is given by the integral of that, of that curve, dz. So uh, we could do that um, uh, in a simple way by assuming an Andersonian faulting model. And then we get this a delta rho um, g times uh, the height um, l squared. And um, we can then plot that, um, that force as a function of lithospheric thickness l. And it's uh, quadratic, and so it increases. Um, and you can see that for a typical lithospheric thickness between 60 and 80 kilometers, um, we would need upwards of 15 teranewtons per meter. So um, if this is the mechanism for faulting, for, for rifting, then we would think that um, the forces associated with subduction could get us there, uh, but the forces associated with these other mechanisms, um, such as uh, uh, uplift, dynamic topography, uh, basal traction could, could not. Okay, now let's just stop thinking in abstract terms and think a little bit about the main Ethiopian rift. Um, so if you if you look at a section of the main Ethiopian rift, um, you know th there there are several sections plotted here uh, with different amounts of extension across them. Um, what you see are uh, lots of evidence for uh, magma and and magmatism um, and without spending a lot of time dissecting the, you know, the, the, the features of this map, um, the conceptual model that you see at the right was produced to try to explain how these magmatic features are related to, um, uh, to the dynamics. And what you can see from the, the plot um, is, again, I wish I had a mouse, um, is that the, the conceptual idea is that magmatism is involved at all stages from incipient rifting uh, all the way down to, to um, the transition from um, to, to uh, mid-ocean ridge type spreading. Um, and so it makes sense to then think about a model in which rifting, in which magmatism is, a, is an essential part of the mechanics. And it isn't just a kind of um, byproduct of what is being forced by other other mechanisms. And so uh, an important um, step in, in thinking about this was taken by Roger Buck in papers in 2004 and 2006. Um, and here's his conceptual model. Uh, we've got now a, um, a buoyant magma, which breaks through the lithosphere due to its buoyancy. Um, and then the force to open the um, uh, the dike is the force that is required to basically keep the magma from just rushing through and, and erupting. So um, that requires rather little force because the density difference between the lithosphere and the magma is not very big. So to keep the magma from just shooting out of the top of the dike to actually accumulate strain on this, on this dike um, requires a force which is given by the difference in gravitational potential energy of the, uh, the, the fluid column in the dike and the lithospheric column that's next, next to it. And that's the integral that's shown at the bottom of the screen. Um, and so you see that once again, we end up with a, um, a quadratic in, in L um, and you uh, having integrated Z dZ, um, and so this gives rise to this blue curve, which is much below the green curve um, because the density difference is, is much smaller. I mean, these are simple order of magnitude calculations, very simple, simple assumptions. Um, but now you can see that the blue curve at 60 to 80 kilometers uh, requires a, a, a force of something like five teranewtons per meter, which is a 
a lot closer to the um, uh, plume mechanism or the dynamic topography mechanism and the um, and the basal traction mechanism, which we discussed. Okay, so these simple models are 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 illustrative, um, but we would like to go a little bit further and try to use geodynamic theory and geodynamic modeling to develop a framework for understanding earth deformation, in particular for understanding continental rifting. Um, and the advantages of this approach of using geodynamics, so geodynamics, um, as, as probably most of you know, is um, as kind of the, the continuum mechanics of the solid earth, or solid and, and, and liquid earth, um, in my case. Uh, and, you know, we can be physically consistent and quantitative, so we don't have to make so many assumptions. Um, hopefully, we can uh, make fewer assumptions and look at um, solutions which obey the physical principles that we understand to be, to be correct, so conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And it gives us a context to explore hypotheses about, for example, um, the, the rheology, the way that rocks respond to stress. Um, do they flow? Do they uh, strain elastically? Or do they fracture and, um, and, and fail plastically? And so it enables us to um, create a context for testing hypotheses. So we always start with observations, um, which we then uh, interpret in terms of assumptions. And assumptions is really, a, in a way, another word for a hypothesis. So we want to test a hypothesis. We then create a geodynamic model that embodies that, that hypothesis. Uh, and, um, and then we make some predictions, which we compare with observations, maybe the ones that motivated us, or maybe a different set, um, to try to see whether that model, and, and therefore that hypothesis, is supported by the observations. Um, and continuum mechanics is the foundation for geodynamics. Not knowing you know, who exactly is in the audience today, I wanted to just give a little bit of background about continuum mechanics. So we're all familiar with, with the Newtonian mechanics of particles, where um, we conserve mass, momentum, and energy. And so for a particle, the sum of the forces acting on that particle, including the body force, uh, is equal to mass times acceleration, where acceleration is the second derivative of position. Um, and we can imagine that our particle is some macroscopic thing like a, like a cannonball, and that as it flies through its trajectory, its mass doesn't change. Um, and so that dmdt represents the mass in a reference frame that's moving with the cannonball. So we're not, um, we're not just looking at a point in space. We're actually we're following the cannonball saying it, its mass is staying the same. And the energy, which we could think of as the, the, um, the heat in the, in the cannonball, um, is also going to be fixed in this reference frame that's moving with the cannonball unless there's some heat addition or, or loss, and that's represented by Q. So if Q, if heat is flowing in or out of it, then its temperature will change. Now, all of these principles apply in continuum mechanics, but instead of looking at forces, we're looking at forces per unit volume and masses per unit volume. So what we have on the right here in the continuum column is the force, which is the divergence of the stress tensor. So that's a force per unit volume. The mass per unit volume, which is the density and times G is the body force per unit volume. And then any accelerations that uh, uh, we have. So that's the inertial force per unit volume. Um, mass conservation relates changes in density to divergences in the flow. So uh, if um, material is moving away from a, a, a place, then the density in that place should be, should be decreasing. And this uh, equation accounts for that. And similarly with the energy equation, we now have diffusion. So um, where uh, there are second derivatives or, or, or curvature in the temperature field, we have convergence of, of heat diffusion and that changes the temperature um, in those places. And so uh, everything that we learned about, um, about simple particle systems uh, applies in continuum mechanics, but now we have to think about the system as, a, as an infinite set of, of particles that are all pushing on each other. And, and that's where these stresses come in. 
So we want to think a little bit about how do we relate the stress tensor to the motion or deformation of the material? Because what we can measure at the surface, say plate tectonics, the speed of rifting, is deformation. We, me we measure motion or, or, uh, or kinematics. Um, and what we'd like to do is explain those kinematics in terms of forces. And so that um, means that we need to relate stresses to strains or strain, um, strain rates. And the science of relating stresses to strains or strain rates is, is the science of rheology. And uh, uh, it's a complicated subject um, with its own journals and so forth. Uh, but we typically think about the rheology of rocks um, in, in terms of a few simple ingredients. So there's a, a there's kind of a viscous model um, where the viscosity, which is written as eta here, represents the rate of, of deformation. So that's epsilon dot V, that's the viscous deformation rate to the stress sigma. So the bigger the stress, the bigger the, um, the, the strain rate and the, um, the, that relationship is controlled by the size of the viscosity eta. Now then there's elasticity and elasticity is more like a spring. And it, it, you might be used to thinking about this as the bigger the stress, the more extension of the spring, but we can take a time derivative of that. So we can say that the, the rate of extension of elastic extension, so this is epsilon dot E, um, is proportional to the rate of change of stress divided by another um, uh, pr proportionality constant, which is the, um, the elastic modulus G. And so there are two ways so far of developing deformation. One is the elastic way and the other is the viscous way. Um, but we're also going to think about plasticity. Now, plasticity is a slightly... Um, more abstract, there are many ways that that um, many sort of physical mechanisms that could be um, uh, taking place that would lead to a plastic like behavior. But at its um, at, at the phenomenological level, what it says is that if the stress is below some limit, so if 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 um, uh, if I'm pulling on a, a steel bar, let's say with a with a small stress then essentially nothing happens. And it's only when the, the stress exceeds some yield stress, so some uh, threshold, um, that we get deformation. And then when we do get deformation, the deformation occurs at a rate which is given by lambda dot um, and in a direction which is given by this gradient in the plastic potential. Now, there's the plasticity theory is, is enough to really tie your head up in knots, and I don't want to do that. Um, now, because I want to focus on the geodynamics. But the key thing to remember about plasticity is that it's a threshold phenomenon. Stress builds up to some yield limit, and then um, and then we get deformation. Uh, Richard, what? excuse me, this is Alec. I Hi, have a question about elasticity. Why yep. you put dots over the epsilon and sigma? Um, I did that because of, of this. Oh, but there's a typo in this. But basically what I want to do is I want to add up all three strain rates. So I want to say um, the total strain rate is the viscous strain rate, the elastic strain rate, and the plastic strain rate all put together. So I take some rock and I impose some uh, state of stress, sigma, sigma dot. Um, and, and then the response is viscous, elastic, and plastic, or you know, potentially plastic, depending on the stress. And all of those things have a, have a rate associated with them. And I want to sum those rates to give me the total rate. Now, what I forgot in this equation at the bottom is to put all the dots there. So please, in your head, put dots over each of those and just sum up the things that you see above. And this is why I put a dot on the sigma, is because I want to sum up the strain rates. Not uh, my question about elasticity was related to G large. I mean, it's the elastic modulus because elastic modulus comes with the epsilon and sigma without rates. Okay, so um, because it's uh, uh, this sigma equals G multiplied by epsilon without dots. 
because dot appears only in the viscosity uh, relation, which is correct, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so we could say- that, that's, that's my point, that uh, G should have a different meaning then, or at least if you will try to integrate this, then, uh, you know, yeah. but, but by definition, elasticity is uh, sigma equals G multiplied by epsilon, okay. Okay, well, as long as G is not rate dependent, then I can take the time derivative of, uh, of the definition of elasticity and I can arrive at this equation. It only would fail if G depends on the rate of deformation or the rate of stress. So as long as it's independent of the rate of stress, then, then this equation is, is a consequence of the one that you've mentioned. Um, and that's the assumption here that G is independent of the rate of stress, which is a common assumption and you know material scientists may say oh certain materials don't behave in this way but um you know i think for for rocks in in most conditions this is is a reasonable okay thank you thing to do okay yeah it's, it's very analog to the burger model uh yeah i mean you know what we see at the bottom is is only one um, possible way of combining these different rheological elements into yeah. a composite. So a Berger model would be another way of combining them into a into a composite. But the simplest of the composite rheologies is the Maxwell composite. And here I've I've used, and it just means you know we're attaching these things in series. So the the you know the stress that they feel is all the same, but the mm -hmm. strain rates are additive, and that's that's the the definition of a Maxwell composite. Okay, so people have taken these kinds of composite rheologies and they've, they've put them into the continuum mechanical framework, which I showed you in the previous slide, and they solve the equations for initial conditions like rifting. And that's what I want to show you in this movie um, from uh, John Nabiloff um, and co-workers in this uh, uh, Nature Comms paper. So what you can see are... Uh, continuum mechanical plastic equivalents of, of faults. Um, and the active ones are shown in yellow and orange and the inactive ones are shown in, in blue, um, where the blue is the, the amount of accumulated strain and the red is the, the, the red brown is the, is the strain rate. Um, and what you see is that as the continent here is being extended, almost all of the deformation is taken up on these faults. So almost all of the deformation is, is sliding. And this is a perfect uh, uh, geodynamical illustration of the first scenario that we talked about, which is the uh, tectonic stretching or fault-related uh, fault stretching. And so there's ductal deformation in the green part at the bottom where you see these, um, these fault zones kind of become spread out. Uh, but um, in the lithosphere, in the shallower part, um, the deformation is almost completely uh, localized onto these, these fault zones. So this is a beautiful um, uh, simulation, a real accomplishment in terms of geodynamical modeling. Um, and I think illustrates a lot of interesting features that could be related to um, the morphology that we see uh, in rifted systems, you know, the, the dip, of faults, the way that blocks are rotated, the thinning of the lithosphere and upwelling of, of a sthenosphere. Um, but one thing that's completely absent from this simulation uh, is magma. And um, we know from observations and also from simple considerations that magma should play an important role in, in rifting. Let me just check the time. Okay. Um, so here's a bit of a summary of that of that previous um, model where you can see uh, on the right um, of the top panel, a Christmas tree diagram, which shows these different layers of the crust and lithosphere um, and their strength. And each of these has a, has a weak um, ductile region at the bottom, which is uh, not a crucial feature of the model, but something that was included in this, in, in this geodynamic model. Um, and if you wanted to, you could integrate that Christmas tree down to um, 60 or 70, 80 kilometers to get the total force that was needed um, to, for this rift. It was big, right? It was, it was certainly big, right? And 
you know, you can look at this in 2D uh, or you can look at it in 3D. And I think what you see on the right hand side here is that for a straight rift segment, so when you don't have anything funny going on with transform offsets, um, the 2D picture is, is quite reasonable um, representation of this, of, of this, these dynamics. Um, okay, so magma isn't in these, and how might we like to incorporate magma in these kinds of models? Well, what we have been looking at so far is more like what's happening in this top um, set of, of diagrams here. That is, we have uh, faulting, and faulting is this kind of motion on, it's parallel to the fracture plane. And that's called mode two, mode two fracturing or mode two uh, slip on a fault. Um, and it means that uh, we're not opening up the, the fracture plane so that fluid, let's say, or, or uh, magma could, could enter. Um, and so there's no uh, divergence in the velocity field. There's no um, change in volume of the solid because uh, we have sliding on faults. With magmatism, um, uh, and with dike injection in particular, um, the, the solid has to open up to allow the magma to come in. So we need to have some divergence in the, the solid velocity field that allows, uh, allows magma to come in. And furthermore, we have to have some um, representation of, of tensile failure, right? Because these cracks, they're either being pulled open, um, which is drawing magma into them, or uh, the magma buoyancy is pushing upward and forcing the crack apart by, by, um, by pushing the, the walls of the fracture open, right? So that, uh, that stuff is not in um, the geodynamic models that I showed you, nor is it, um, is it easy to put it in, and, and we'll talk about that. So, so this is a, a model where the fracture is a, um, is a discrete discontinuity. So it's not represented in a continuum level. Um, it's actually, uh, it has a boundary, it has a face and wall. And what you see here is um, in the bottom left is the uh, circular shape due to injection of a fluid into a rock. So you, the injection point is at the center of that circle. And there's a penny-shaped fracture, which we're looking at face, face on. And then as more fluid is injected, uh, that circle grows. The injection stops after a couple of square meters of, of fluid has been injected. And then the buoyancy of the fluid causes the fracture to propagate vertically. And it, it grows vertically in this funny um, sort of dumbbell shape, this elongated uh, shape. And the aperture, so the, the, the width uh, of opening between the fracture walls is grayscale here. And so we can see this opening uh, of the fracture upward. And with time, the fracture propagates upward due to the buoyancy of the fluid that's contained in it. And so the question is, can we somehow, um, can we somehow include this behavior in a continuum model, which could work uh, in a kind of analogous way that plasticity can model faults in the geodynamic models that I showed you before? So can we, can we do something analogous to the plastic represent, representation of faulting um, for dikes? So now we need to go from a one-phase continuum mechanical model to a two-phase continuum mechanical model. And I imagine that there are, there are probably very few people in the audience who have worked with two-phase continuum mechanics. Um, it is more complicated because now we need to worry about not just the solid velocity, but also the liquid velocity. And so we have VL representing the liquid and VS representing the solid. And these are two kind of interpenetrating velocity fields. Uh, that is, they are defined at every point in space. And at any point in space, the volume fraction of liquid is given by phi. And so the top equation is a kind of modified Stokes equation. So a bit like the one phase example, where we have pressure gradients, uh, viscous shear stresses, but now we also have viscous compaction stresses. So these are the ones associated with the divergence or convergence of the solid, and then there are body forces. And the segregation of liquid and solid, so the difference between the two velocity fields, is governed by something like Darcy's law. So anyone who's familiar with uh, porous uh, groundwater flow might recognize that this um, segregation of liquid and solid is driven by pressure gradients and, and, and body forces, and that K phi 
is a permeability and mu is the liquid viscosity. So whereas before we had a, a incompressible um, solid leading to a divergence-free velocity field, now the solid can be divergent. So the solid can move out of the way to let fluid come in. The solid and the liquid are still incompressible, but the two-phase mixture can have a, uh, a, a divergent solid field. Now, the porosity weighted or the phase fraction weighted velocity field is divergence free. And that's what div V bar means. And that means that the phases are independently incompressible. But now we have this phase fraction phi, which evolves due to the, the divergence of the velocity field, which is given by C, this curly C. Um, I don't want to dwell on this. It's OK if this is unfamiliar and you haven't really followed what I've said. Um, we need to just think about the continuum is now containing both liquid and solid, and these things are both going to be modeled um, using uh, uh, Newtonian uh, type mechanics. Okay, so we're going to elaborate the the um, the Maxwell model a little bit because um, we're going to add in a second viscosity. So there's going to be a viscosity um, which we had before, which is this eta phi, and then there's the elasticity represented by that spring. Um, and plasticity at the right is this is the plastic slider, the little uh, arrow pointing downward. But now the plastic part has been modified for a, a viscoplastic rheology. Um, and this is largely for purposes of numerical um, uh, stability and resolution. So I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, and we're we're going to talk about a yield stress, which is now not just a constant value, but depends on the effective pressure. So the effective pressure is the compressive stress in the solid. So when the solid is in compression, um, it's much harder to break it. When the solid is in tension, then you can see this black line sloping downward. Um, it's easier to break it. So uh, if 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 we're at a neutral state where the solid is in neither tension or compression, um, and we go up the y-axis, then where the black line intersects the y-axis, that's the yield stress. But you see that as we go, we put the solid into tension, we need less yield stress. And essentially, when we get to a tension of sigma t, then the solid will just break in tension. It doesn't need any shear stress at all to break. Um, and that's known as the cohesion. So if you if you inject fluid into a solid and you exceed the cohesion of the solid, then you can simply split apart the solid um, without any shear stress. That's used in, in industrial fracking. Okay, so we solve this model um, using a new code and the top panel here just shows you shear failures associated with the, um, the compressive part of the yield stress. So this is, uh, faults like what we saw in that simulation by Nabilov. Um, and it demonstrates that this, this two-phase formulation can reproduce that aspect of the model. But we have a new mode of failure, which is taking place um, when the solid is in tension. And so that's what's shown in the bottom here. And what you're seeing again is the, is the strain rate. Um, and so what you can see is a vertical feature where um, at the tip of that vertical feature, there are strain in these, in these lobes around the tip. And so this is the continuum mechanical representation of a fracture, right? Of a, of a mode two fracture. So it's, it's not a fault, it's a opening mode fracture and it's filled with, with fluid. And we can see that in more detail in this set of panels. So this is the same calculation now, but the top left panel is the fraction of liquid um, the middle top panel is the strain rate. The right top panel is the solid divergence. So this is how much solid is sort of the rate at which solid is moving out of the way to make space for fluid. Um, the bottom left panel shows the strain, uh, the stress intensity, the shear stress intensity. Um, delta P is the difference in pressure between the solid and the liquid. And uh, the bottom right one we're not going to talk about, so we'll ignore that. So what are the features of this dike-like or this um, mode two-like continuum mechanical feature? Well, its porosity is not one. So um, it isn't, at least at the resolution that we have, filled with fluid. 
But the difficulty here is that on a numerical grid where the grid size is, is uh, of order hundreds of meters, um, we wouldn't expect to be able to resolve something as narrow as a dike, which might have a, 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 a width of say one meter or less. Um, so we could think of this as kind of a smoothed out representation of, of a dike in some sense. Um, and what I'm not showing here, because I didn't know that uh, people uh, you know, like Eleonora would be in the audience, um, is a comparison between the stress field around the fracture tip uh, and that which you would be, predict with linear elastic fracture mechanics, where you actually have a discrete um, uh, uh, fracture. And the, the agreement is remarkable. The stress fields are, are, are almost the same. Of course, you have to adjust the fracture toughness to align the, the two exactly. But um, the pattern is almost the same. Um, and, and so um, the argument that we think is, is appropriate here is that in some sense, not exactly, but in some sense, in a similar sense that the, 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 the geodynamic models that I showed you before capture faulting, that this two-phase flow geodynamic model is capturing diking. So it's capturing some kind of uh, mode two failure. So these are movies. Now on the left is the strain rate magnitude and on the right is the shear stress magnitude. And this thing in the center is a magma filled um, uh, blob. So think of this as a kind of uh, magma chamber that would be sitting at the bottom of the lithosphere because say magma had been sourced from a, from a plume. So let's play this one. Um, and you can see that this, this dike propagates upward. Meanwhile, we have brittle faulting at the surface and eventually there's a connection between the dike propagating upward and the faults that are propagating downward. And I'll play now the stress movie. So here you can see stress concentrations at the, um, at the tip of the dike. I should say this is a log scale. So, um, oops. so we can see strain rate concentrations and stress concentrations at the tip of this uh, dike and at the tip of the faults, eventually the fault and the dike interact and we get this combined feature that uh, crosses the surface. Um, uh, playing this one again, you can see uh, very strong stress concentrations at the tip of this, of this dike-like feature as it propagates upward and connects with the faults. Um, I'm running out of time, so I don't wanna dwell on this, um, but uh, the speed, and the um, uh, is depends a, a bit on the time step. And so this model requires quite small time steps, which is a limitation. Um, but we can see that as we take smaller and smaller time steps, we converge. The left panel shows the position of the tip of the dike as a function of time. So the slope of those lines is the rate of propagation. Um, and as we go from purple to red, we're going to smaller, uh, finer grids, I should say, and we see a convergence in that rate. And then in the right panel, um, the propagation rate is, is uh, given on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the ratio of, of, of different forcing. So let me just focus on the square points. Um, the gray points are different time steps. And as we go from a 50-year time step to a five-year time step, we see that the propagation rate is increasing, but the difference is getting smaller, showing that we're converging on a, on a propagation rate. Um, now, if we look at the, the forcing factors, so the red curve represents the, um, the tectonic extension that's applied at the sides of the domain, and the black curve represents the density difference between liquid and solid, so the buoyancy. We can see that this fracture is driven dominantly by the extension that's imposed. So it's a tension fracture caused by pulling the domain apart. Um, and, uh, and so we haven't so far been able to capture uh, the buoyancy driven aspect of this, of this problem. Um, but let me show you now, this is a more geodynamically relevant scenario because what we have in this case is a viscosity gradient. So you can think of this as a lithosphere above an asthenosphere with a magmatic uh, blob in that blue in the top left panel. Um, and again, the, the, the dike-like feature propagates vertically, interacts with faults. And in this case, we've looked at um, what happens when you now 
take the permeability, so the 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 the, the sort of transmissivity of of magma. We say it depends on the plastic failure. So where you have plastic failure, you enhance the permeability, which means that, that magma can move along the dike with less resistance, even though the, the, the porosity or the melt fraction in the dike is, is relatively low. And so by, by changing the permeability, we can um, uh, increase the speed of melt propagation and, the, and therefore the speed at which this, um, this dike propagates and that shows that there is some buoyancy control on, um, uh, or it indicates, let's say, that there's some buoyancy control on the speed. So let's come to the bottom line, and this is the second to last slide. So what does this say about the force, right? So we've constructed this elaborate geodynamical model, and we've shown that um, if we incorporate um, plastic tensile failure, and we allow for um, divergence of the solid velocity, that we can capture something that looks like dikes. Um, and when we do that, um, what we can do is then measure the force required to extend, right? So we, we can measure the force uh, that's needed to uh, pull apart the, the, the lithosphere. And what's plotted in this figure is the extensional force normalized by the case where we have no magma. So that dashed line, that dashed curve is the tectonic case. So there is faulting, um, but there's no diking. And so when we normalize by that curve, then everything is relative to the, to the tectonic case. And you can see these magmatic cases have um, a lower uh, force required for diking, and it depends on this viscosity, eta k. Now, eta k is a numerical stabilization factor. So what we would like is for eta k to be as small as possible. Um, we can still run the model, uh, but, um, but the viscosity itself, eta k, is not contributing much to the solution. So as we make eta k smaller and smaller, what we see is that the force required to extend goes down and down. And so for a eta k of 10 to the 19 Pascal seconds, which is still a large viscosity, um, we see that we've decreased the extensional, the normalized extensional force by a factor of two over the case with tectonic um, stresses. And so um, it's, it's illustrating, again, the, um, the role of magmatism in promoting rifting and reducing the force needed for rifting. So these models capture the strength reduction due to dikes, but they don't seem yet to capture the buoyant ascent rate. And that's something that we need to, um, to continue working on. So I wanna conclude just by saying that what I've showed you is work in progress. Um, and we've, we've developed a geodynamical tool which can begin to approximate uh, uh, the existence of, of dikes. And, um, and what we'd like to do is go from illustration to investigation. We'd like to be able to uh, look at scenarios like what you see on the right. Now that's, that's a tall order. That's not gonna be uh, a simple thing to do, um, but that's the, that's the direction that we're trying to move in is to build on these simple um, uh, single dike models to something which might represent more of a, of a realistic tectonic scenario, um, such as you see in the East African Rift System. Um, we still have a long way to go, but um, I hope I've given you an indication that we're making some progress in that direction. So I thank you for your attention. Um, I'm sorry if the level at which this, this went was, um, was too fast or too slow for you, but I encourage you to, um, to ask questions about clarification or anything that, that interested you um, now, that, uh, now that we're done. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard. It was uh, very interesting. So, yeah, the floor is open to questions. Uh, Alik, you can, uh, you have a question? Actually, that's a plot, but I have a question. But first, it's uh, <laughs> Karim. <laughs> oh, th thanks. Thanks, Richard. That's amazing. I mean, I remember the first time I, I, I started listening about this goes back to 2009 when Murat Gerberg came, came to ICTP and he has given a talk on a, a similar subject. And it's amazing how much of knowledge we've been gaining since then. And uh, thanks, really. Uh, just to, to, to keep a little bit the, the science close to observations, uh, uh, 
so the, the viscoelastic, viscoplastic model that you're using is this basically the Duretz something model that is extended to a two phase that you're showing here? Exactly. Oh, okay. Did, so, I cite, did I not cite his, his paper? I should have. Uh, I didn't. Yeah. That um, is that's absolutely fine. something that we've adapted from um, from Durez. And, and and I mean, do you assume a sort of a constant density difference between your two phase between your solid and liquid? Just to, you know, I mean, if you look at the East African rifts, I mean, there are discussions whether the the, the magma propagation goes with dikes or seals. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very important point. The The density of magmas can vary wildly due to silicate content um, and the density of the uh, of the ambient rocks varies because they're stratified um, and because of previous uh, accumulation of, of lavas of different, different chemistry. To say nothing of the fact that when you decompress a volatile rich uh, magma, it forms bubbles and that drastically reduces its density and its viscosity. So we're, we can move a little bit in that direction, I think, eventually, if we have a compositional model for, uh, for um, the, the system, you know, we could say have silicate rich and silicate poor magmas and have viscosity and density that depends on that. Um, but this is never going to uh, allow for the kind of, um, you know, detailed petrological and, uh, and thermochemical uh, density modeling that one might like to see. So it can't, you know, if the questions that you're asking are, uh, require a detailed model of density, then this would not be the tool to address them. So we're limited in what questions we can, we can address with this kind of model because of of that kind of limitation that you uh, you hint at in your question. And then, then the very last question, and then I will stop. It's amazing. I mean, what you call diking is 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 plastic failure. So the forcing here is is mechanical. You, you, you do not you're not putting any thermodynamics within the the, the the pathway. Right. I mean, I mean, yeah. So the the way that we understand fracture is really tied up with energetics with with the energy required to you know create new surfaces um, elastic energy viscous dissipation energy um, but it's mechanical energy really so the um, although we think about it in terms of energetics it has a, an equally valid uh, interpretation in terms of pure mechanics um, and that's you know, what we're playing on here is that mechanical interpretation. Now, I've been saying dikes, but really I should say pseudo dikes or even, you know, plastic tensile failures. But I get excited because it looks an awful lot like a dike and we want to believe that it represents a dike. You know, should we be looking at these geodynamic models of rifting that have plastic uh, shear failure and saying those are false? I don't know. I mean, it's a philosophical point to some extent. They're plastic yeah, shear yeah. failures in a geodynamical model. Yeah. I agree, yes. But thanks. this is what we would like to be able to say about it. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Okay, so Alik, your turn. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, just uh, I will switch my video as well. Oh, sorry. Ah. Yeah, Richard, thank you very much. It was a quite interesting to uh, uh, remind something which uh, was a, a discussion for many years. Uh, actually, you referred to the John uh, Leibov paper, uh, but uh, I think it's uh, something like 20 years ago, Palikov published a paper in Nature also about exactly the same stuff. It's uh, about this, uh, how, how, uh, yeah. That, that, that's yeah. that's that's such a feature, <laughs> not exactly like a John did, but I, I, I just just to, to mention that it's uh, because it's uh, I work at that time it's uh, uh, closely with the salt tectonics and he did it for the salt tectonics uh, issues and so on. Yeah, okay, yes, uh, but this is uh, not uh, so much uh, just just to remind if you don't know this paper. But uh, the issue is you use uh, uh, this for elastoplastic rheology. That's in general fine. But what is the contribution of elasticity at the age of 100 million years? 
Um, it's an excellent question. And I think, you know, when you look at these models and you say, well, these are these are very slow strain rates, they're very um, uh, long time periods. Why, why does elasticity play an important role at all? And the it's a subtle answer. It I think that you um, you don't necessarily see it in the behavior of the solutions. But if you didn't have elasticity, the solver, the plastics solver, would converge uh, very badly. Um, and the reasons, I mean, are are technical, and I'm not sure that. You know, I can do them justice right now, but the the basic idea is: imagine that you have a um, something that's 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 straining viscoelastically, and suddenly you hit the yield stress, right? And it yields, right? So you now have a a very sharp change in the material properties, and if you have elasticity, then some of that um, sudden change gets accommodated elastically. Which means that you you have a way of 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 shifting the stress basically from the viscous part onto the plastic part via this 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 spring. So um, it smooths the kind of time evolution of the of the stress um, distribution between the viscous part and the plastic part, uh, and this is. You know, if you're looking at the stresses related to the to the yield stress, it means that the stresses are not um, jumping so uh, rapidly from um, below the yield stress to above the yield stress. They're evolving more gradually. Now, I would be if if I were you, I would be unsatisfied with that explanation. It's very excellent explanation, actually. <laughs> I, I thought in this so, direction. Yeah. <laughs> we use it. We use it essentially to stabilize. I don't think it is a key aspect of the solution. I think it's there to stabilize the the numerics. Yes, the, the numerics. Uh, I can't really emphasize enough. These numerics create headaches in in people. Um, all right. And, and the pe the postdocs who are working on this project have been heroic in, you know, coping with headaches and figuring out ways to 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 get a relief. Um, uh, another point is it's uh, <clears throat> related to the it is a more geological probably issue because it's uh, um, in your model there is uh, any. Um, I mean, it's a, you. You mentioned specifically. Uh, you know, I like its introduction specifically for those who are not uh, so much uh, interested. And you told there is the issue of the chicken and egg, or it is a chicken and egg. And in this case, I just uh, um, I would like to mention specifically that it's not any, uh, mm, let's say, magmatism lead to rifting. Particularly, uh, if you consider the Siberian uh, platform, uh, is a, as you know, it's a huge magmatism was during the less than one million years during the period of time, <laughs> very short in Triassic, but yes. uh, was no any rifting to observe there. Lithosphere is a, something like 150 meter, uh, kilometers and the crust 40, 41 kilometers. Sedimentary basin over there, something like, if I remember correctly, something like eight kilometers. You know, it's a very interesting structure. Flat uh, the crust, the sedimentary basin on the top, and the very thick lithosphere. Nevertheless, <laughs> it was a great magmatism there. Yeah. No rifts, no rifts in yeah. Yeah. And that is that is a something geologically. And uh, there is a, we we have to think about this. Uh, what is the reason really for this? And what is the more exciting for me that during the uh, after Triassic time, something like uh, from two hundred thirty million years till today. There is no subsidence except something like uh, 20 meters. Mm. Another exciting thing is the keeping lithosphere on the top with no any change. Uh, and uh, last point is uh, just about the model, because it's, uh, you briefly mentioned your model, which you use now. The viscosity of fluid is a constant or depends on temperature or something like that? Yeah, good good point. The the viscosity in these models depends on the melt fraction, so the porosity. Um, 
But because we don't solve for temperature yet, um, we don't have a temperature dependent viscosity. So the viscosity that I showed you in the more realistic geodynamic model was simply prescribed as a function of depth. Um, of course, you know, temperature is extremely important in controlling viscosity and also in, in, in melting and freezing. And that is, you know, probably the next major model development step that we need to take uh, with, with these kinds of things. Um, but that's not in what I showed today. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the uh, presentation. You. So the next question is Amea. Okay. Thank you so much. Very nice talk. Okay. Uh, so my question is already asked. Because I, in the main, I work in the main Ethiopian drift. So we have seen basin one the localization of deformation, just like the one you show in the slide, without the magma in the system. So uh, how much magma is important? How, how important is magma to localize deformation? I mean, we can see a strain localization without magma. So I would be happy if you comment on that. And the other one is when we consider magma, it weakens the crust as long as it's in a melt or in a liquid state. But when this magma solidifies, uh, it becomes really strong. So I want to make sure that I understood this concept very well. So if you comment on these two topics, that would be really nice. Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, you know, you're you're as much an authority you're as anyone on this. So I I mean I can't tell you, you know, I can't say that I can explain this all to you. Um, I What I can say is that it is common that people say, ah, oh, but not all rifts are magmatic. So, you know, magma must not be playing an important role. And um, I mean, that's a difficult one. I, I would like to know, you know, how confident are we that we can exclude uh, magmatic injection into the lithosphere? Um, and, you know, if even if it's not observed at the surface. So, you know, if we can absolutely rule out uh, any magmatism at any level of the lithosphere at all, um, then I think, you know, we would need to be thinking about, well, okay, then what is weakening the lithosphere to enable uh, extension at the rates that are, are, are observed? Um, and maybe it's pre-existing structure or, or something like that. So, you know, it definitely is possible. Uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not trying to rule it out by, by any means, but it is surprising, I would say, that the, the low forces associated with rifts that are not connected to subduction zones um, lead to deformation rates that can be, you know, relatively rapid. And if it's not magmatism, then I think it calls for some other explanation. Hmm. Um, I hope that that is addressing the first the first point. Now the second point you said. Can you remind me again what the second one was? Yeah. So the magma weakens the crust oh, as yeah, long yeah. as it's in a melt or liquid state. Absolutely. So so there's this, there's a very transient phase where the dike is injected, and if there's sufficient tension um, in the rocks already, uh, then they as the magma passes through some. Um, offset or some some irreversible separation is 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 uh, achieved in, in you know due to the dike. If there's compression, then maybe it's, a dike can pass through um, if it's buoyant enough. But then once it's passed, the rocks will go right back to where they started from, and you won't have achieved any extension. So so to achieve extension, you you need some tension. So there's this trend, very short pulse where there's magma that's liquid, and then you achieve some extension. And if you repeat that over and over again, um, then you can accumulate extension. But the other thing is that when you inject magma into the lithosphere, of course, the, the latent heat and the sensible heat that those deposit in the lithosphere change the temperature of the lithosphere. And over uh, many cycles of, of dike injections, then the temperature can be, can be modified and um, and the, the viscosity can be reduced. Now, to quantify that, you need a, a whole, another type of model, which um, which I haven't shown. But um, over a longer time scale, I think that that could also be relevant. Okay, thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you. I should say we we almost met, right? In in yeah, yes, we did. You were you were you had funding to come to Oxford, and then yeah. a COVID, yeah. uh, which yeah. uh, curses is its name, uh, turned up and and prevented it. But I hope that we'll have a chance to meet in person. Yeah, yeah I really hope so. Thank you. Thanks for the question. The next question is Pauline Gary. Uh, hi, um, so I'm Pauline. Uh, thank you very much for your clear and interesting presentation. That was really cool. Um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is, is, is there a difference between the impact of the active and on, of the inactive faults on the linkage between the faults and the upward diking, you know? And the second one is related, is that uh, can dike force reactivate the old faults? Yeah, um, the interaction between faults and dikes was one of the, um, the themes of the project. Um, and one of the things that really, I think, um, you know, at a technical level motivated what we were trying to do. So, uh, because it, it's, it's possible to say something about that without getting the speed of dike propagation right, I think. So, um, and so it might be something that we can actually work on. That said, um, we haven't actually started to address the question that you raised because um, we're simply just trying to write up what we've done so far. And the next step, I think, is to begin to look at um, the interaction between dikes and faults. Now, I think um, whether that's an important and observed feature in, um, in rift zones is is controversial. And um, I don't know if Eleonora is still here, but she probably has an opinion about that. Um, I think it's it's very plausible that there's some mechanical interaction between dikes and faults. And as you say, you know, existing faults that are inactive could be reactivated um, uh, uh, because of the stress field that is the consequence of, of, of diking. Um, but I think we need I need to read the literature a bit better. And I also think that we need to analyze the models in, in a bit more detail, looking at that physical problem. Thank you very much. Mm. Any, any other question? Ah, Eleonora. Yes, Eleonora. Thank you. Um, actually have a comment. I am really, really happy to see this. I think it's great progress. Uh, of course, there are uh, more things to do, as you also say, but it is uh, the first time that I see um, dealing with this issue, which is very important, I believe. So you touched on so many points. I don't even know which one I should uh, I should uh, comment on. You know, but one one maybe the one that surprised surprised me. I don't know. You 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 mentioned that uh, we should first uh, exclude that magmatism is important. Is not excluded that it is in never ne uh, uh, that there are cases where it, it's not important. I believe you are totally right that uh, um, there are many, many cases of uh, 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 volcanic rifts where actually in, in the crust there is, is full of seeds. And uh, so therefore it is absolutely very important to, to consider this. I believe it is a very fundamental. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I am very happy to see <laughs> Very, very happy to see it. And I, I just, you said that where the crust is very full of something, and I didn't. Still, 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 still. The dike, the horizontal oh, yes. dike. Projection. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I didn't catch that word. Okay, yeah. It, yes, so I think you are, you, yeah, you're right. I agreed with so many things uh, that you said. Yes. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> lovely to hear. If I may, I don't know, Eleanor, are you finished with the comment? E yes. Okay, I want to share one little thing just because I'm excited to show you this. Um, so can you see that? Yes. Okay, so this is a figure from a manuscript that we're working on. Um, and what it shows is a analysis of the stress field around the tip of what we would call a dike. It's a plastic tensile failure. 
right? Yeah. And so this is the, the computational result shown here. It's just a zoom in on this, on this tip. And then the blue dots show a kind of coordinate system where um, we're looking at a specific radius um, uh, away from the dike tip and then yeah. scanning through theta. Now that theta is plotted on the horizontal coordinate here and sigma scaled by sigma max is plotted on the vertical coordinate. And these are the XX, the ZZ and the XZ components of the stress tensor. And what you see is that our continuum model looks just like the, um, the uh, uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics solution for the stress field around a dike tip. Yeah. Um, and asymptotically, so this is the distance from the dike tip from um, larger to smaller distance. You can see that the, the stresses asymptotically as you approach the dike tip increase with uh, one on square root of R, just like in linear elastic fracture mechanics. So this made me so happy because um, it isn't, you know, it isn't obvious that in a complex viscoelastoplastic model you would you would get this this stress field, um, and if you didn't, then you'd struggle to say that you modeled anything like a dike, um, but you do, and and I think that's that's pretty cool. Um, you know, Tim has been instrumental in helping to 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 work this out. So you know, Tim, he's a former PhD student of yours. Um, so yes. yeah, I think this is an exciting result. I thought felt like it was probably too technical for the talk, but I'm glad that I can share it with you. It's great. It looks really great. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Everyone is excited here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, do you have do you have do you have ways to have to add the memory for previous plastic deformations that you have in your system? Yes. Um, most people use a a kind of damage variable where you say that, you know, we have this, this um, plastic strain rate lambda dot. And if we, if we integrate that at a point in space or at a point in the material in time, then we get some kind of accumulated plastic strain. And what we say is that as that plastic strain accumulates, the damage uh, associated with it accumulates. And then basically once you've damaged the rock, then the rock ha has this, this permanent weakness to it. So you track you track the accumulated plastic strain. And I mean, this, this probably goes back to the Polyakov paper that, that, that Alec mentioned. It's not, a new, um, it's not a new idea. People have formalized it in you know, damage mechanics and the thermodynamics associated with damage mechanics. But um, from a kind of phenomenological perspective, it's been, it's been in these plastic, plastic models for some time. And we are just what we are doing is essentially no different from what previous workers have done on, in that regard, except for that now we're applying it both to shear failure and also to mode, mode two tensile failure. Yeah. The code that you're using, you're running it on a simple computer or you, you're relying on uh, high performance computing here? You can run it. The, the low resolution runs are on, a, are on a desktop computer. It's a bit inconvenient. Um, the higher resolution runs, the you know, and the ones with the small time steps were all run um, in parallel, but not on a not on a you know you don't need like a, some mega computer. It's you know it's all um, you know ten order ten cores um, or probably even less than that, probably eight cores, something like that. Interesting. So it's not it's not high performance computing really. Are your mesh adapted? No, no. Yeah, it would be great if if there was some you know software engineer out there who decided to help us out, but that's way way above my pay grade. I don't do it. I don't do that kind of computation. It's just it's that's heavy duty stuff. And about the memory, which they yeah. mentioned by Karim, I think it's also interesting to look at the Andrade rheology. Because it's it's uh, uh, you know the integral with some core which plays as a memory for the lithospheric stress, for example, and uh, it's uh, it, it is not uh, actually used a lot in uh, lithospheric dynamics, but uh, I think it has some uh, meaning. There are several papers by Birger uh, who published in Geophysical Journal International, but maybe something 25-30 years ago. 
yeah. and, and the other ideology exactly shows that this uh, memory accumulation and so on, but it mostly was a theoretical paper related to instabilities and so on. Yeah, uh, but, but still, yeah, it's yeah, could be interesting. I mean, I think what you're touching on a couple of things. One is with analasticity. Analasticity is where you have recoverable viscous strain. So the physical mechanisms behind analasticity are are debated, but um, it's this kind of funny thing where you can you slowly strain something, but then somehow that strain creeps back, um, and you get that in you know simpler rheologies like the Berger uh, model. Um, but Andrade goes further and says that there is, it's like an, it's like an infinite sum of dash pots in a way where each one has its own kind of characteristic response. And so what you get is a, is a, a rheology that depends on the, the frequency, let's say of deformation. So if I take it and I, you know, I force it at one frequency, I get, you know, one, rheology, one, one sort of effective viscosity. And if I force it at a much slower frequency, then I get another one. And this allows you to model, you know, things like um, uh, post-glacial rebound, um, post-seismic creep, uh, 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 attenuation of seismic waves using the same rock mechanical framework that you would use to model mantle convection. So when you have a huge spread of time scales in the deformation, then the Andre rheology gives you basically the, the, the levers and, and dials that you need to fit all of these types of deformation. But nobody understands physically what is going on that would lead to this Andre rheology. It's a parameterization of a, of a frequency dependent res material response. Um, and I, yeah, so yeah. I mean, you can, it's essentially adding parameters, lots of parameters to a model. And if you do that, you just have to then be careful that you, you can understand, you know, you can wrap your head around what is actually then what the model is doing and why. And um, I worry that I wouldn't be able to if I did that. With four exponents, you can fit an elephant, yeah? yeah. <laughs> Fermi told it, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, so I think uh, we have had a very good discussion. I can't see any more uh, question. So we'll thank you again uh, um, very, very much, uh, Richard, for this presentation and a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, yeah, it was extremely interesting. Thank you very much. It's great Thank to see you. Um, um, and to see everyone. Again. Yeah. Thanks yep. for all the And I think, yeah, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.